This morning I want to bring you a message from Luke 9. In fact, I hope to be in Luke 9 all day. Tonight I want to be, uh, if you notice here, we're in verses 1 through 6 and then verses uh, 10 through 17. But I hope to preach from Luke 7, 8, and 9 tonight. I encourage you to come out. Lord Bill will be here at 6.30 tonight to start reading and serving. <coughs> here in these verses though, in Luke 9, we see the disciples experience. Now the word disciple means follower. By definition, that makes we're disciples of Christ. We are followers of Christ, Christians. But I'm talking here in Luke 9 about the apostles, which are a special kind of follower, because there are only 12 of them originally. One of those flunked out. His name was Judas. But the other 11 are Peter, Andrew, James, and John, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. It's these apostles who were there with Jesus during His life and ministry and also uh, saw Jesus after the resurrection. That's a qualification for an apostle. I get that in Acts chapter 1. That's where it's from. These men knew Jesus during His ministry, saw Jesus after His resurrection, and then they taught the message of Jesus to the world. By the time you get to Acts chapter 17, the Bible says they had turned the world upside down. In Luke chapter 9, we see their experience with what Jesus enabled them to do. Jesus made them somebody. <coughs> we see that the focus remained, even though they could do incredible miracles, the, the focus always remained on Jesus. And we see here in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus, if all you have is Jesus, you've always got more than enough. Luke chapter 9, beginning verse 1, the Bible says this. He says, when Jesus had called the twelve together, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. <clears throat> and He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. He told them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money. No extra to it. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave their town as a testimony <coughs> against them. So, they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. <coughs> If you skip down now to verse 10, the Bible continues, says this. The apostles have been sent out to preach. Verse 10 says this. It says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Then he took them with him, and they went through by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I love this part. And he healed those who needed healing. Late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, <clears throat> Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and country fight, uh, countryside and find food and lodging. Because we are in a remote place here. He replied, You give them something to eat. They answered, We have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd, about 5,000 men were there. But Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so and everybody sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people. They all ate and were satisfied. 
And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you love us. You care about us. You're compassionate towards us. And you want us all to be saved. Because Jesus is always enough. May your word be presented here. May you be glorified in this place. Use us. Work among us. Fill us with your spirit. Direct our steps so that we'll live for your glory every day you give us life here. I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. In Luke chapter 9, we see the apostles, they become somebody because of Jesus. It says there in verse 1, it says, Jesus called the twelve together and he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases and he sent them out. Now, when I say the disciples, were, they became somebody, it's not that they weren't somebody. I mean, they were still Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Philip. They were still their own person, but Jesus made them somebody. Because without Jesus, they were just Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were just fishermen. Matthew was just a tax collector. Simon the Zealot, he was just a guy with a radical a belief system about the politics of his day in the Jewish nation. They were just average Joes. So far as we know, they had no education, they had no power, they had no authority, they had no clout. They were just, they were just, just like us. Just normal people. But in Jesus, and because they followed Jesus, they left what they knew. They followed Jesus because Jesus said so. He said, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Because they went, they followed Jesus, they became somebody. When I say that, I mean, Jesus empowered them to do some miraculous things. It says that uh, He gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. Now, if you think that would be cool, then you head like this right here. Amen. Amen. He gave them power and authority. Verse 6 says, so they set out. They set out went from village to village preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. By themselves, they're ordinary Joes. They're just another guy. They're just another tax collector. Just another fisherman. They're just nobody. But Jesus empowered them. They became somebody. And specifically for the apostles, they had this power to cast out demons and to heal diseases. And they went around preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Now if you notice here in this text, in Luke chapter 9, the Bible says... The disciples, they go out to preach. How long they're gone, we don't know for sure. But they return. Verse 10 says, when they return, they reported to Jesus. And I imagine there's a lot of excitement. They come back, man, you never believe what I did. Man, who would have thought that the Lord could use me to do something like this? But they're healing the sick. They're casting out demons. They come back and report to Jesus everything that they had done. The Bible says He took them with Him Jesus took the disciples with him and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it. Let me ask you, church, who did the crowds follow? Jesus. The crowds learned about it. Jesus took the disciples and followed. They all went to Bethsaida, but the crowds followed him. The crowds followed Jesus. I'm going to ask you a question, why? The apostles just went and preached the, the, the surrounding country. They were casting out demons. They were healing the sick. I mean, what couldn't they do? They were doing what Jesus empowered them to do, which is pretty well exactly what Jesus had been doing. Why wouldn't, the, why wouldn't all the people follow the disciples? Because everybody knows the buck stops with Jesus. Jesus is the head here who's giving the power and uh, authority out to anybody else who's doing miracles. And they don't, miss, they don't miss the point. Jesus is where it's at. And anywhere when you study the Bible, Jesus is word out. So we're surrounded by a bunch of people who believe that, that we, should, we should focus on Jesus, but also on the mother of Jesus. When the Bible tells us Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says, uh, When the wise men came to the house where Jesus was, they saw the house, and they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. 
When John the Baptist was baptized, and the Bible says, Heaven, the voice from heaven came, This is my son. This is my son of my love. With him, I'm well pleased. The Bible says in Matthew 17, when uh, Peter, Andrew, uh, Peter, James, and John, rather, Peter, James, and John are on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they are with Jesus is Moses and Elijah. And Peter said, Man, we ought to build three tabernacles here, three altars here. What it was, altars. Need to build three altars here, one for you, Jesus, one for Moses, one for Elijah. But God the Father said in Matthew 17, He said, um, This is my Son, who, whom I love. With Him I'm well pleased. Listen to Him. Buck stops with Jesus. It's never going to be about anybody else who's doing anything else in the name of Jesus. It's never going to be about a preacher. It's never going to be about a Sunday school teacher. It's never going to be about somebody who's leading other people to Christ. It's always going to be about Christ who conquered sin and rose from the dead. It's always all about Jesus. The disciples had became somebody in Jesus. They could teach and preach and heal. But the focus remained on Jesus and the crowds followed Jesus. Now as the crowds followed near Bethsaida where Jesus and the apostles were, a big crowd gathered. And the Bible says, it says uh, as the crowd came, He welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God. I love that at the first end, uh, end of verse 11. And uh, He healed those who needed healing. I just like that. They came and He welcomed them and he healed them. And then the Bible says, the disciples, now remember, remember these guys had just been teaching, preaching, um, and healing people and driving out demons. They've just done all those miracles. They've just done all that teaching. They've just come back to Jesus. Now all these people are here. They're thinking in their, in their minds. So man, here we are at the countryside. It's kind of rural out here. There's no, there's no McDonald's for miles. There's nothing to eat out here, man. I'll tell you what, uh, <clears throat> it's getting kind of late, too. It's going on 4.30. It's going to be dark soon. The headlights on the chariots ain't working that good these days, you know. Uh, these people have come a long way. they got a long way to go. They don't have anything to eat, or they're going to stay here. They're going to sleep here tonight. And they come to Jesus with all their, with all their wisdom. and just They were right. There were some serious logistic issues here for this crowd following Jesus. The Bible says in verse 12, it says late in the afternoon they came to him and they came to Jesus and they said, <coughs> just like you and I might be guilty of doing from time to time, they seem to think that Jesus needed their advice. You ever done that? Lord, what we really need here is this. Lord, I'm not telling you what to do, but this is what I think should happen. He knows better than we do about anything that you got on your mind. The disciples, though, come to Jesus and they say, Lord, it's getting late. You ought to send these people away to the surrounding villages and countryside so they can find food and lodging. Why don't you send the crowd away, Lord? It's what you need to do. It's getting late. We don't have the resources. Jesus answers them in verse 13. He says, you give them something to eat. And in reply to that in verse 14, they said, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Now this miracle is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, and here in Luke chapter 9, it's also recorded in John's Gospel, John chapter 6. When you read John chapter 6, there was a little boy there who had this basket. A little boy had a basket of food, and that's where it came from Five barley loaves, and the Bible says in John 6, two small fish. And that's all they had among the crowd. The Bible says 5,000 men were there. Because this is recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the feeding of the 5,000 is, is the only miracle, aside from the resurrection of Jesus, that is found in all four Gospels. <coughs> now, Jesus also fed 4,000 men on another occasion, and that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four Gospels. They come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, send the crowd away. It's late. What are we going to do with all these people? It's so far away. It's such a remote place. What are, you going to, what are we going to do? What are you going to do? Send the crowds away, Lord. He said, you give them something.
something to eat. And they said, man, well, well, yeah, we looked everybody over here. There's one little boy. There's five barley loaves. There's two small fish. But what are they among so many? Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. I believe it's there in John chapter 6 where it says eight, eight months wages would not buy every man a bite. Are you want us to buy food for all these people, Lord? <clears throat> 5,000 men are here. Not to mention the women and children, which some had to be there, surely. Jesus just said, you have the pot and the disciples, have the people sit down, have them sit down. They did so, and everybody sat down in groups of 50. A hundred groups of 50. There's not even two groups of 50 in this building this morning. But a hundred groups of 50 sitting down around the, the hillside, here, there, and yonder, maybe as far as you can see, just about. A hundred groups of 50. 5,000 men. Plus women and children, some other groups of 50. Everybody sits down. Jesus takes the five loaves, the two fish. He looks up to heaven. He gives thanks. The Bible says he gave it to the disciples. They took it to everybody else. It says they all ate and were satisfied. Everybody there, everybody seated. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. When you look at where these disciples came from, they, they left their livelihoods to follow Jesus. They left their homes, they left what, their business, they left what they knew to follow Jesus. Jesus said, come on, make your fishers men, and they win. And since they followed Jesus, they have, they've seen Jesus heal all kinds of diseases, like in Luke 5, the paralyzed men. They've seen Jesus in, in Luke chapter 7 raise the dead. Young man, I say you, get up. They see Jesus in Luke chapter 8 in the middle of a fierce storm with the wind and the waves and the thunder and lightning. Jesus says, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves obey the commands of Jesus. The disciples, not just what Jesus did, but now they've been commissioned with the power and authority of Jesus to go do some of that themselves. And they've gone about preaching the good news and healing people everywhere. But when they see a crowd of 5,000 men, when they see, man, all we got in this whole crowd, we can cure pneumonia and cancer, man, ain't no problem. But all we got to eat here is five loaves of bread and two fish. For Jesus, that's all we got. <coughs> They learned firsthand in Luke chapter 9, the disciples did, the apostles of our Lord. If you got Jesus, you got more than enough. And when everybody ate all that they wanted, it's a bottomless buffet. You eat till you're satisfied, and there's still 12 basketfuls left over. What can we learn here today? Hopefully learn a few things real quick. Uh, number one, if you're in Christ, you're somebody. Amen. If you're in Christ, you're somebody. Because the Bible says, this whole thing we call the Bible goes back to a promise. God made one man named Abraham as far as Jesus is concerned, the Messiah that would come. God said, Abraham, through your offspring, every nation, every tribe, every people on earth will be blessed. And if you're in Christ, you're not just somebody. You're not just an average Joe. You got an average Joe job. You live in an average Joe house. You drive an average Joe car, but you're not an average Joe. Because the Bible says in Christ you are a child of God. First John chapter 3, verse 1. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Christian, if you're in Christ, you're somebody. Because you're a child of God through faith by the blood of Jesus Christ. You're a child of God. You remember God loves you because you're His child. He hears you when you pray because you're His own. And we're filled with the Holy Spirit through obedience to the Word of God, the Spirit that calls out Abba, Father. And the word Abba just means Daddy. The Spirit calls out the Holy Spirit of Christ lives in us. We're children of God. You're somebody. 
We're somebody because we're children of God. And secondly, what can we learn today? The focus, no matter what we do, no matter what we accomplish, no matter how much we grow in our, in our faith to spiritual maturity, no matter how, how many other people we lead to Christ, no matter how much Scripture we know, no matter how many sermons we preach, no matter how successful other people would say you are in your faith and your Christianity, it's not about you. And it's never going to be about you. Amen. It's always going to be about Jesus. Because the Bible tells us, it says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. The Hebrew writer, after chapter 11, let me read that this afternoon. By faith, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, by faith, they were killed, they were stoned, they were sawed in two. By faith, the saints of old gained the victory. And we're surrounded by those faithful saints spiritually. Because of that, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, verse 2. The author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The focus, you're somebody, you're a child of God. But the focus has always got to remain on Jesus. The seed of Abraham, the root of Jesse, the bright morning star, the buck stops here forevermore. The one who was dead, behold, is alive forevermore. And he's at the right hand of the throne of God. In Christ, you're a child of God. Stay focused on Jesus. And lastly, Jesus is always enough. He's always enough. You say, man, I, I, I know what you're saying, and here we are in church, that's what you're supposed to say, but I've got problems, I've got bills, we've got uh, problems at home, we've got kids misbehaving, we've got things going on, we've got Thanksgiving coming up, preacher, you know what kind of headache it's going to be for me? I'm not going to sleep between now and then. If you got Jesus, you you got more than enough. Don't get carried away with the things that seem so important. You gotta get the turkey in. I know. The potatoes got the potatoes gotta be mashed, man. Somebody's gotta do it. You gotta mix the stuff. You girls gonna be up cooking all night long, bless your heart. Stay focused. <laughs> People hopefully still gonna love you even if dinner's late. Even me. Mom says no. No, okay. <laughs> Stay focused on what's important. The things that seem to be so important that we run ourselves ragged for. It's not that important in the scheme of them. What if you don't make it to work on time? What, what if you are late? What if they do fire you? God's still on the throne. Stay focused on the important things. Now we know that to do our jobs, we've got to work hard, work with all our heart, because the Bible says so. So try hard to be on time for work. Try hard to do your best. Do what you do. Do it all for the glory of God. But stay focused on Jesus. Because when you got Jesus, you always got enough. And I'm not making that up. The Bible says always in Jesus. The Bible says always, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, be thanks to God. Give, uh, but thanks to God, thanks be to God, who always, He always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere <coughs> the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. That's us Christians, the church. Thanks be to God, He always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ Jesus. Through us, we're spreading the knowledge of His fragrance. We're spreading His message sufficient to save all the world. When you got Jesus, you always win. There's no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus is always more than enough. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, He says, Now to Him, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 21. He's able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or all you imagine. Stay focused on Jesus. The buck stops here. In Jesus, you're somebody, you're a child of God, you don't deserve it, you couldn't earn it. But it's what you get because His grace is sufficient. God loves you. You're created in His image. You exist for His glory. And He's willing to provide all you need. Your greatest needs and need for a Savior, which He met before any of us was born through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
When we read here in Luke chapter 9, it says uh, the crowds came to him, he welcomed them. And he, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. It's what I'm speaking about today. The church is the kingdom of God on earth. It's the church. He welcomed them. He spoke to them about the kingdom of God and He healed those who needed healing. Whether you feel like you need healing or not, the Bible says you do. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel bad. You don't have to feel like a sinner. God has declared it so. The Word that is alive and active and sharper than any double-edged sword, the Word that heaven and earth will pass away, the Word of God will never pass away. The Word declares... All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if you'll look at it, what God has declared so, everyone who sins, Jesus said, John chapter 8, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You're a sinner and you're lost. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's the commandment that's first and greatest. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. You don't have to feel guilty. You don't have to feel shameful. You don't have to feel like a sinner. God has declared it so. Regardless of how you feel, if you're not in Christ, you're not a child of God, you're not saved, you're not a saint, because of that you have no hope. But God's patient. He's merciful. He's wanting the crowds to follow like they followed him to best save in Luke chapter 9. He's wanting the crowds to follow him today. And he's asking that you make the decision today. And the way we do it, we call it an invitation. Him, we stand and sing. But uh, the invitation comes from heaven, the third heaven, the presence of God. That the gospel's preached, preached it please God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. The invitation's from the third heaven, and he's, he's allowing him. For his gospel will be presented one more time. And it's falling on ears today. And maybe some of those ears are open ears. And maybe somebody will respond to God's invitation. Because the power of the gospel is still changing lives around the world today. It changed lives in this room. You can be a child of God. You've got to stay focused on Jesus because Jesus is always enough. 